very brief. And now it's time for some brief reports from our working groups. And um, Jennifer, do you want to start with Pigs Gusset? Sure. Um, yes, Pigs Gusset Initiative, as Sue Ellen pointed out, is named after the English rendition of the name for this area. Um, we have a couple of things coming up. We have an upcoming showing of the Stonebreakers documentary, which is an award-winning film. Um, it will be Thursday, April 11th from 6.30 to 8.30 at the library. There'll be a facilitated discussion after the showing of the film. We'll have light refreshments. And this is a co-sponsorship between Pigs Gusset and the library. And after I finish my report, I will put the flyer in the chat for people to take and feel free to share with your networks. Um, Pigs Gusset is also involved in an ongoing work with um, for a Watertown Indigenous History Tour story map. It's a collaborative with the Historical Society of Watertown, the Library and Public Arts and Culture Planner. And we're hoping to have this ready for 2030 and probably before then. And then we are also planning for our third Indigenous Peoples Day, which we will be celebrating on October 13th, Sunday, the day before the official Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and we'll be celebrating from 12 to four at the Hosmer Elementary School. We will have musicians, crafters, storytellers, vendors, and indigenous foods. So stay tuned for that. And um, we're excited as always about this event. So that's our update and report. And I'll put the information about the Stonebreakers film um, in the chat. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Pam, Friends of Bees. Any updates? Sure. Um, we've set the hours for the garden tour. It's going to be from 10 to 2. Can you it then? Sunday. Hello? Oh, I thought I heard someone talking. On Sunday, June 23rd. And uh, we just met with um, Katie Swan and Laurel Schwab uh, the, uh, to talk about what we could do to help it advance the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. And uh, we've decided we're, we're going to have a pod picking contest over the summer when, in which we will encourage people to pick the pods of the black swallowwort, which is a very bad invasive weed that threatens monarch butterflies. And we'll have a prize for whoever brings in the most pods. And oh, no. we're also looking into how we can help people um, uh, plant more milkweed and nectar plants if they would like a little assistance with that. And um, that's where we are for now. Thanks. Boy, the pod con contest sounds like a lot of fun and really helpful for our environment. Uh, Peace and Common Security, do you guys want to give an update? Sure, I'll do that one. Um, so the Peace and Common Security group is uh, working diligently. Uh, we are continuing to hold our uh, weekly vigil on s s Saturdays from 12 to 1 under the banner of Let Gaza Live and um, Permanent Ceasefire in Gaza and Palestine. We've had a great turnout this last week um, from people not only from Watertown, but from uh, Brighton and Brookline and Newton. And so it's been, a, it will continue that until further notice. Um, so that's every Saturday from 12 to 1. Um, we're doing a program on the 14th of April uh, which is entitled Palestine and Ireland, um, Occupation, Resistance, and Hope. Uh, that will be at St. John's um, Church. I believe we, the time we're doing that, we're still a little bit working out the details, is around four, four, uh, around seven o'clock. Uh, and we'll have the details to that put out uh, soon. Um, also, I'm putting in the chat, um, three things that we're looking people to sign, some that you need to do uh, at, uh, online and some that uh, you need to do in person. But the three are, the first two have to do with uh, what we call Back from the Brink, which is a campaign to <laughs> bring people's awareness to the second existential threat, nuclear war and nuclear weapons. And so you can go on to sign a petition to Representative Clark 
asking her to support a particular piece of legislation that's in the House. And you also could sign, um, and you can uh, do this uh, in person, this one you'll have to do in person, is to get a petition, a citizen's petition in front of the city council, uh, which would also um, uh, call to request, uh, ask the council to support back from the brink. And the final piece in this three request for signatures is a signature that you can get through by doing the, the QR code uh, and you're signing a letter in support of a ceasefire and solidarity with Palestine for a group that we are co collaborating with called Watertown for Palestine. And I'll put that in the chat and I think that's it. Okay, thank you, Tony. Just one little minor uh, clarification. Uh, Tony was referring to the event that's happening at St. John's Church, but actually that's the former St. John's. So oh, it's sorry. actually Vermont Watertown United uh, Methodist Church on um, Mount Auburn Street. Uh, anyone from Watertown Faces Climate Change who would like to give any kind of report? Deborah? Sure, I can give a report. Um, okay, there's just there's a couple of things. Of course, we've been busy. Um, the uh, coming up is the Birdo. Um, maybe you've not heard that word before, but I hope um, you will start hearing it. The Birdo is an ordinance that will allow the city to require buildings to assess, report, and reduce their emissions over time. Um, these ordinances have been enabled by recent state legislation and are considered a key element in any kind of climate um, uh, emissions reduction. So members have been working really hard to create um, uh, to a draft for the SPERDO uh, with members of WE3C. And um, they've had to, uh, you know, to look at what will actually work, how can it be effective, how will businesses and buildings um, actually comply? Uh, very hard work, but um, that's pretty much done. And I think the next time you hear about it will be when it's going to the city council for their vote. Um, so we're very hopeful about that. Uh, the state climate, the state uh, climate legislation is going to be coming out soon, and so we're keeping our eye on that. We expect there's going to be one big climate bill and maybe a few smaller ones. Um, that uh, combine sort of the various initiatives. And um, we are just sort of keeping our eye to make sure all the critical pieces are there and that the state can move forward. Polluters Pay, one of our favorites initiated by Steve Owens, um, has not did not get passed out of committee. So we're going to continuing to work on gathering support. Um, and getting a constituency, um, a local constituency for it. So we may be going to the city council for that and asking for a resolution of support. So you'll be hearing more about polluters pay. All right, thank you. So I'll give a brief update on refugee support group. Uh, we just successfully moved a Venezuelan family that had been sleeping at the airport. Uh, we helped pay for them for a few weeks in a hotel. Uh, in Waltham as an interim step and as we're trying to figure out what to do. And they've now been taken in <clears throat> by a host family indefinitely in Waltham and the kids are now registered in school or three children. So that was a big deal. Um, at the local level, we've just been working hard, getting more people, helping more people find jobs. Everyone's pretty much uh, got work permits. Uh, we've got um, kids in school. We've got um, 21 kids enrolled in the public schools, elementary, middle, and high schools. We've got two children in special programs. Uh, we've got 21 infants, toddlers, and preschoolers enrolled in preschools and daycares in Watertown and Waltham. And um, just kids in, enrolled in summer, summer programs. We've got 35 adults taking English that Jerry Byer and Chuck Dickinson have been doing twice a week at the former St. John's or Belmont <laughs> Watertown United Methodist Church. So a lot of really great stuff's been happening. We've got healthcare providers pretty much for just about everyone at this point within a bus ride of Watertown. So lots of good things, but we are in the middle of a crisis that we have to face because we've just found out recently that 
you know, the state wants to shut down the hotel where all these families are staying and move them and consolidate families that are in, in shelters that are supposedly are without official state service providers, even though that's what we have been functioning as since August with all these families. And um, so we are in a bit of a of a panic and trying to deal with a horrible possibility that all these families will be shipped out to a large hotel shelter in Lowell and have to start all over again. Parents would lose their jobs, the kids, their schools, their daycare sent slots, you know, just so many things would be just absolutely wretched about this happening. So we are going to start trying to muster um, a fight with the state to try to get these local families to stay longer, um, even though we all know that housing is a big, big issue and, and needs to be worked on, but you can't actually find housing and find a place where people can pay rents, even with help from the state, unless they have jobs and, um, and are learning English and all those other things. So that's kind of where we are right now. Not a, It's a little bit of a crazy time with wonderful things happening on one side and the other side is specter hanging over us of what is going to happen in the next few weeks, literally. So, so before we turn it over to Jennifer, I just wanted to give a plug for our annual meeting, if I might, because I'm going to be have to leave at eight o'clock just so that we could talk about our, our annual meeting, which is on June 2nd, Sunday. Uh, we'll be at the uh, UU Church, and we have a guest speaker, uh, a well-known author, Globe uh, columnist named Stephen Kinzer. So the potluck is at 5.30. And then we usually do a short business meeting, and then um, Steve Stephen uh, will speak, and uh, we'll be having our potluck in the in the downstairs area, and in the sanctuary will be where the program takes place. Um, so just to, and then I forgot to mention that we'll be doing a film around Israel Palestine on May 11th at the library. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I also just wanted to mention for any of you to help spread the word or think about it yourselves, that we have some vacancies on our steering committee for Watertown Citizens for Peace, Justice and the Environment. So if you are interested or know anyone who might be interested, just please speak it up and um, and hopefully we will have some nice responses and move forward to filling those vacancies. And without further ado, I will turn this over to Jennifer who will introduce Saron Daly. Thank you, Sue Ellen, and thank you everybody from the working groups. I always am so impressed when we start out this meeting and to hear all the work that people are doing in the various working groups. There's a lot of really good work going on here in Watertown and I'm proud to be part of that. So thank you to everybody who's working so hard. Um, I'm really excited um, to be uh, welcoming Dr. Saron Daly. Um, from her biography, she describes herself as an avid thought leader, a prolific professional coach, a talent acquisition strategist, and a champion of equity and inclusion. She has her BA in history from Trinity College, her master's in education from Harvard University, and she has her doctorate from Boston College in educational leadership. And she's very talented in many ways. And I will just say from my own experience of meeting her, um, at our second Indigenous Peoples Day, which was Octo this past October 1st, um, she came and she had not even started working for the Watertown Public Schools. And I was just like so surprised and so thrilled that there she was. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe you're here and you haven't even started working yet. And she's like, well, I love these community events. That's what this is all about. And I really feel that we are very fortunate to have Saren, um, Dr. Daly, um, in this role as Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Watertown. I think she really gets it. I think she's she's only been here for six months and she's made all these connections into the community and outreaching to people. And so I'm really excited to have her here presenting and I wanna be supportive of her work, her and the work that she's doing in the schools. Um, and I really appreciate everything that she's done so far and I'm sure she'll be doing a lot more. Um, and so 
that's all I want to say. I want to thank all of you for coming to be here and to support her and the work that she's doing. And I am going to do the slideshow part and she is going to do the talking. So I will mute myself and I will share. Shall I go ahead and share the screen? Soon? Yeah, please do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for inviting me. Um, it's weird when you hear people talk about yourself in the third person. So I'm always intrigued about who that person is and she sounds pretty cool and I might want to <laughs> hang out with her. So um, so what I have, and I hope it loads up again when it comes up, um, I was asked to come and share. Just so you know, Jennifer, it has something else that's showing. It's not the slide deck. That's not showing? Mm -mm. It says like your, your screen sharing is paused. Oh, let's try it again. All right. And while the technical um, things go, I will share with you what I was thinking of doing as I was invited to talk about the work I'm doing. So first I thought I would give an introduction of who I am. Um, and the and the work I've been doing in the district and then ways in which you all can help us do our work. So if you go to the next slide. So that is showing? Yep, it is now. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. So the first mystery is the pronunciation of my name. It's funny because whenever I introduce myself, I say, um, Saren Daly, and I spell my last name. And it has been a joke in our family, like, why are you spelling your last name, D-A-L-Y, and not helping people with the first name? Um, I just, I, I, I guess I've lived with it so long. But the best way I use to help people understand the pronunciation is thinking serendipity. And it's the first, my name is very French. So when you lean into that space, it's because... That's sort of the, the origins of it. My family's from, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the name is a French name and it was with a Caribbean accent. So serendipity helps um, with the pronunciation. The other is I wanted to talk about what we're doing here in Watertown Public Schools. And in particular, what we're doing to build and sustain an anti-bias anti and anti-racist community. And at the end is just what we can do to support each other. So next slide. At the school-based level, we have equity facilitators that are faculty um, or staff that are in the middle school and at the elementary schools. And also this particular norms are set up by our diversity and belonging councils as well. And we use this as a form of norms to create a really safe space when we come together. So I thought tonight, I wanna also share these norms with our audience and encourage us to agree on this space as we engage in our conversation today. So be curious and ask questions. I think that's one of my favorite things. Um, when you're comfortable asking questions, you know you're always in a learning stance. Um, the hardest thing is to believe that you can hold multiple realities. You can have two different feelings or opinions being this, true at the same time. And we offer that up as we have these conversations. Um, you don't know yet. You know, this is something that is a journey. It's it's a it's a it's a marathon and it's a marathon in a loop because our work is never finished. We're always learning more and getting to new levels of learning from each other. I love this one about use I statements and stories stay in learning's lead. That's another, it's kind of an interesting statement to make in a in a Zoom meeting <laughs> that's recorded. But the spirit is that this is a space and a place where we can have and share and that our intent is to leave with learnings that we derive from our conversations. And the last is it's okay to disagree. Um, that's how we learn from each other as we understand others' perspectives, but it's not okay to blame, shame, or attack. And these are the these norms I was introduced to when I came to Watertown Public Schools by the diversity and, and, and belonging council. So this is this is one of the indicators for me of an, a community that is really intent on creating safe spaces for conversations. So next slide. So I love 
showing this picture. Um, so my bio and all, you know, you can look at LinkedIn, you can find out all about an individual and their academic and professional journey. But I always think it's important for others to understand my why. So this is Ava. And she serves to remind me of why I do what I do, because I've known her since she was 15 years old, a sophomore at a high school in Boston. And she was a student in my high school, a teacher program that I ran in Boston Public Schools. And she was 15. I left before she graduated from high school and I went to Wheelock College. Um, and when I was at Wheelock, one of the things I did was I wanted to create more college access and success programs. So we created a new program called Passion for Action and Ava applied. And she only thought about Wheelock obviously because she knew that I was there and she wanted to um, at least explore one of those options. So the program I was I designed was specifically for students like Ava, students who are really committed to doing service, interested in doing um, giving more, needing some clarity about where they sit in their what their place was in the world, and how best can they contribute, and. Many of them had never left the state. Some of them never left the region and many of them had never flown on flights. So she had gotten one of the scholarships. She came to Wheelock and over the course of the four years, she did service in the city. She did service in New Orleans and this was a service trip that she took to Ghana. Now this was the first time she'd ever been on a plane the first time she'd ever gotten a passport. And this moment here was the first time she had taught an early childhood lesson to a group of students. And of course they wanted to take a picture and they took a picture of her, w wanted me to take a picture of her. So this photograph, the reason I keep it and I remember it was that she looked at this on our bus ride back to the hotel and was really emotional about the picture. And she had said, I, I know I wanted to teach, I've always wanted to teach, but it was in this moment she realized that this is the feeling it gets when you share something with a group of students and what it feels like when they're grateful and thankful for the interaction. And for me, what is powerful about this picture is that it's very rare to have a snapshot of a moment when someone discovers the thing they love to do and that was this moment. Um, I have no idea. You, Jennifer, you mentioned how I'd come to different events and um, before I worked at in Watertown. I have no idea who people are. And I like to be in places where people are and, and learn from a community or an individual and, and help figure out ways in which both sides, reciprocity that we both um, win from our opportunity together. Um, Ava's still teaching, which is amazing. Um, master's degree, she has traveled more. Um, she has a child now. But this, rem this reminds me of the simple things and the difficult things and the challenging things and all the things that we do in our work, how important it is and how impactful it could be by creating little opportunities for others to be able to explore what they want to do and enjoy. Um, next slide. So yeah, I when I started, and it was weird, it is six months, and I was looking at the March 13th is literally the six month to the day. So it was very strange that we're doing this presentation. Um, but when I began, I yeah, I, I knew my official date was on the 13th, and when I spoke with Dr. Galson, I already knew that obviously school had already started. So I had to figure out ways in which I would be able to become familiar and learn and have people know who I am. And so I did pop up in different events. Um, I went to the restorative justice training and it was great because I got to meet a whole group of middle school teachers who were deciding to be early adopters. Um, I didn't even know that it was a big deal. I went to the multicultural, multilingual departments family welcome day and it was amazing and it was big and small and spurts because there were lots of families there and then families left 
But the point is that I didn't know that it was unusual for me to be present. For me, I didn't know I wanted to meet these families and see how as a district, we welcome families to the community. And it was very powerful. Um, I went um, to start as a, as a community, as a group of leaders, the whole district is involved, the cabinet level is involved in some very high, um, high level intensive um, year long training on walking the talk. And that's the way I would frame it. We're looking to create and sustain a, 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 an anti-racist, anti-bias community. And part of that is as leaders, we have to be able to understand the work that we're asking our colleagues to embark on as well. And so, yeah, this is not like, this was not a plug, Jennifer. This is in my presentation because it was a significant thing. And I was blown away by the day. And what, what drew me to it is that it reminded me of the Lowell Fest, the um, Culture Fest that they had, and I'll share with you at the end of our slides, but it felt very community. It felt, felt very um, accessible. It felt very informative. It was playful. Um, and it just felt like people stayed because they wanted to stay and came because they couldn't wait to see what was happening. And that helped me understand about Watertown. Next slide. So I went to a lot of other things while I started my first 30 days. And I said, I wanted to just listen and learn. Um, one of my favorite things was going to the Embrace Boston sculpture in the Boston Commons. Um, it was on a Sunday, I think. Is it a Sunday? Was it a Sunday? I can't, Saturday, Sunday, yeah. Um, and I did, I just, families were coming together and I wanted an opportunity for families to meet me in a, in a sort of, in an in a equal equal space, equal stance, um, a, a community, a gathering where they actually were, I had to come to their home to learn about their work. Um, it was an event that, that really was simple. It was just a gathering. Kids were playing, um, parents were talking. Um, I, I had some really fun um, just stories and jokes with some of the families I met. And again, it just gave me a sense of who this community was that I was joining. And inverse, they hope they got a chance to meet me. I really pride myself in trying to be the same person in all the spaces I'm in. I've said before, and I tell my kids that it's really complicated to put on stuff because you have to remember who you are in each room. If you're the same person in all the same places, then you don't have to worry about who you are, who you were when someone met you. So I hope you've had a chance to see that there's some similarity and there's some commitment there. Um, the first diversity and belonging joint meeting was another place where I shared some of these very thoughts with the first time I met with a cross section of families at um, at the Hosmer. Hmm, was it at the Hosmer? Oh goodness, the joint meeting. I won't tell you where because I won't remember. But so the significance there was my first introduction to the community. And what people wanted to know was what was I, what was, what was I going to do? Okay. Um, what was my stance on things? What did I feel I could bring and what should I quote change? Um, I don't blow up things. I don't believe in, 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 in not learning from what has been before. So if you go to the next slide, one of the things that was most impactful for me is that in those first 30 days, I made it a commitment to talk to lots of people. And the one single thing I learned was there's a lot going on in Watertown. There are lots of people who are very committed to the families and the schools in Watertown. And I was excited because I felt like my job is so much easier because all it is is connecting and collaborating and making bigger some of the things that people have already started, amplifying things or being thought partners or talking about the next level of the way in which we want it to sort of push our work out. I do, one of the things I do believe in is um, accessible communication. So from the very beginning of my time, I set a block of time and from 10.30 to 11 and 3.30 to four, every 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, anyone can sign up and talk and meet with me for office hours. I have to tell you, I didn't put it online and I have not put it on my email because I'm trying to manage the flow of that, but I will soon when I have more, um, when I have more staff to help me with the other things that I'm doing, but people can still get in touch with me. And I think we've had those conversations throughout the time people have actually connected with me and we've spoken about possibilities for next year. Next slide. So there was a question about what are we working on this year? And I'm gonna use this to talk also about what next year's um, goals are. So as I shared before, leadership matters and members and having members of the committee, including Dr. Galson, participate in a year long course entitled Race, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion being co-facilitated by Desi and the Harvard Ed School um, is important because we're walking the talk and actually taking the time um, to together build a team, but individually learn as well. Um, as you know, the district has committed as part of its strategic plan to do a, a four, has a four year implementation plan to roll out restorative justice. So we've had restorative justice um, early adopters at the middle school and a cross district leadership team. That's also, again, leadership matters. All of the school leaders in the district and administrators are involved in restorative justice training beyond tier one. If we're gonna be asking our staff to utilize these processes, it's important for the leaders to be early adopters themselves, and that way they can share and support their staff as it rolls out. The, I don't know if you, I, I haven't heard of diversity and belonging councils at other districts, and I, it's not like I've gone around and polled people, but I do know the idea of having a group that that is, families, caregivers, and staff committed to creating ways in which conversations around diversity and belonging are held on a, at least a monthly basis at a school is such a is 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 a really powerful statement as a, as a community, but it also gives access in very small ways to families to be connected without having big events where they feel overwhelmed or it is all about something more than just being in collaboration and in relationship. So the, the diversity councils are something that I've tried to be connected to. Um, we have diversity, we have equity facilitators that I again inherited when I came here. They start off as specialists. And I told my team after the first meeting that I'm not a specialist, you should not be considered a specialist you're really a facilitator of conversations. And I would say that the relief in their um, minds about, oh good, so we can actually be in a learning stance, absolutely. I envision next year that the work between the diversity councils and the equity facilitators and the school-based culture and climate committees are gonna be really connected and as well the PTO, but connected to all the adults and caregivers who are already contributing to support schools. So you might see a little bit more of that next year. I came and inherited a concept that the elementary teachers were doing, which I thought was brilliant. And I think it came from the DBC that school, that all elementary teachers were using the same um, book and the DBC read it over the summer, the DBC Diversity and Belonging Councils read it over the summer. And then the equity facilitators facilitated conversations with staff around that book for the following year. So this fall, all year, that was the, that was some of the professional learning that happened on a regular basis in schools, facilitated by peers. Next slide. And some of these things, my first conversation with Dr. Galson was about, um, Actually, these these two top two bullets here were the first conversations. One is that we really need to relaunch the anti-bias coalition. It was a community of individuals that really benefit benefited from the fellowship and the and the 
collaboration and we need to figure out as a district how we relaunch it. So that was something that I committed to and worked with. Um, we did a meet and greet in November and we have since met every month. Um, we were supposed to meet on Monday and I was deathly ill, not deathly ill, I was ill, not a, ill. Um, but the beauty of that is that back and forth emails, it wasn't about um, missing, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a cancellation. It was intentionally a postponement because the value of any of these convenings is that we commit to holding it. And April 1st, we will have a session and April 29th, we'll have our April one because it is about committing to the gathering and the work that we have said we would do together. Um, the refreshing of the Peter Kauf Memorial Art Installation. I came into this conversation in October with a community wanting to heal over a process that felt um, challenging. And, and the outcome of that is that we had students working with Josh Weiner in the middle school to create all these different artifacts to describe his um, to describe his gifts. And now those artifacts are gonna be used by our high school students to create an installation at the middle school from artists from humanity. Um, my reason for sharing this is that it's a very, I wanna make note of that there's a wide bandwidth of my work and it may seem unusual, but what I felt that was important here was that this was a very important part of the community and how can me and my role help to support the community heal from, from an issue, an incident that will yield a really positive outcome, but there was a process that we engaged in so that there was a healing process. The annual unity, uh, youth and unity, um, unity breakfast. I am, I'm, I was very honored to be a keynote speaker. I had no idea of all the keynoting I would be doing. Um, but I'm smiling only because it felt I'd never, I mean, I, we were in the studio downstairs at the, it, it was a really cool opportunity to be the arbiter, to the messenger of all these great things that were happening in the city. Um, so again, a unique place, but I felt like it was an important voice and I, I, I enjoyed um, as much as an introvert can enjoy being in front of a camera and saying lots of things. Um, but the, the piece that is profound is that as a result of unity, the Unity Breakfast, there's a whole new initiative that started, which is a youth in unity. And it was a place and a time for all of the schools and our students to contribute um, ways in which they are reflecting on the values of Martin Luther King Jr. And it came out in so many different and unique ways. So it's now become something we'll do each year. And school leaders are talking about, can we begin with thinking about it in the fall so they can do what they did more of this year which is lots of really interesting portfolios and activities. So in other words, that community event and the district participating in that community event now led to another place and space for the communities of our schools and their families to have another opportunity to gather and be in, in community. Um, the last two things I would say is where I'm also thinking of heading for next year is our students student voice. I was blown away sitting in the audience when the Multilingual Leadership school Club from the high school presented to the faculty in the high school about their experiences as students. Profound. What was more profound was after hearing the feedback from students, the faculty retreated into restorative justice circles to engage in a conversation about what they've learned. And 
to almost all the members, I because I can't speak to 100%, but I know that most of the faculty were so proud of the voices that, that these students reflected the leaders that they wanted them to be both in their high school and what they saw them leading once they left the institution. It made me think about how we can amplify the student voice by amplifying um, leadership, social justice. Um, the Kingian program, I've talked with members in the middle school about what would it look like when they're off leading in so many different ways at the high school. So we need to figure out and create more opportunities for them to lead in that space. All right, next slide. So the next part of this is really talking about my goals now. So you have to know, um, I've shared these goals with the school committee as part of our um, budgeting process. We have to add, we have to frame why we need this, the resources that we um, need. So this is my second public venue where you are learning about my goals. And um, so it would have been the third because on Monday I would have done it for the anti-bias coalition. So you get to be the second. Um, I'm a very traditional, um, well, I take a very traditional stance in goal setting. I think goals, just as, just as um, the district has four priorities that are listed there, my goals will always nest within these priorities because the only way for us to move um, to accomplish our goals is that if we're all collectively working in our, each of our ways to fulfill some of the priorities. So I wanna start with this, that my, my priorities will be, will be focused on four priority areas, cultivating belonging and social emotional wellness, challenging students with rigorous instruction, um, creating a learning community and utilizing all available resources for student needs. Before I move on, how does anyone have questions? Because I don't want to, I feel like I've been talking a lot. Is this is this a good pace for folks? Yeah. That sounds good. So I, I can go. A good pace. Yep. Okay, good. Um, so if you go to the next slide. As I had shared before, my goals are all nested within our priority. So this is a little bit of a technical part of our the presentation. But I thought it, I wanted you to see what I'm working on and not have it be abstract. But I will inter intersplice between the goal with some with visual ideas so it doesn't feel as stated. So I'm excited about the opportunity to provide professional learning for all school staff, both teaching and non-teaching roles that enable them to learn culturally responsive, anti-bias and anti-racist practices to advance racial equity. If you go to the next slide, this is a really concrete example of what that looks like. This is what was done last year. Teacher-led, well, actually community-led through the DVC, teacher-led and, and adopted. But this is a great way to talk about how do you provide the resources and allow the professionals with guidance and support to understand, unpack, and, and, and utilize the strategies that it will make that will be useful for them in their classroom. Next slide. So I think I shared earlier, my office is responsible for leading the execution of our district's district-wide four-year implementation plan. Last year, I we talked about um, there was an early adopter for the middle school. There was an early adopting group across the district. So we'll be offering, um, we'll be increasing the number of staff at each school trained in tier one. We'll be providing tier two training for all the staff that has done who were early adopters. And we'll be piloting some RJ training for our high school students. And the question mark is really around the leadership development piece. So it's gonna be couched in that space. Um, I'm also interested in offering um, restorative justice training for our and members of our DBC. And I've had people ask those questions. So this is tier one. The most important and valuable thing about restorative justice 
um, training is it's a it's an understanding of a way in which you can be in communication that allows us to hear and hear and allow us to be able to act collectively and collaboratively. So the idea that our high school students may learn some of these strategies and have it embedded in leadership roles um, that that we're expanding so our um, our, our caregivers who come to DBC and want to be part of that group wants to learn some of these strategies. So that's how is this upcoming year, year two rollout will look. It's intentionally open because I will have more specificity as the year um, concludes and as we begin, but I wanted to give you that framework. And there has been a whole, I'm sorry, next slide. Everyone wants to know what restorative justice is. These values, if you replace it with leadership, strong leadership, this is all about citizenry. Imagine our high school students graduating from this district with this these set of skills. And I'm a big proponent of legacy. Our students in the high school have a responsibility to their younger peers in the middle and elementary school. And so the leadership isn't going to live only at the high school level. Some of the best messengers of certain things are someone just a little older. So I'm very excited about that. And, and by the way, they will design what it looks like high school students, because they know what's going to be best useful for their peers. Next slide. What I love about um, this graphic is restorative justice work is focused on identifying root causes and strengthening the foundation of a community. If you look at all the winds that blow, I don't know the way, other way to say it, I think it is winds blowing. Um, and then you see the found the root. So our pursuit as a district is since we've made the commitment of four year implementation, that means as families and community members, you should start to see evidence of convenings being operate being um, held in certain ways, certain languages, um, certain terms being used. And I hope students, uh, what a great aspirational goal that in a couple of years, students are the ones that are having conversations with peers when there are certain conversations that they needed to, if there was harm happening at the school base level, that they first be, they may be the first ones to, to talk to their peers about how they their behavior has harmed their whole community. Next slide. And there are core assumptions in this work. So the reason I shared all three is that it's easy to think of restorative justice as an idea. And in many ways it is, because the practice of it is process driven. But there are basic core assumptions that you can then see if you read any of these seven, again, think about leadership, Think about the value of what happens when we convene our DBCs. Think about when kids are at K-12, because I've been pre-K to 12, because I've been taught by my pre-K principal that third graders can have very powerful conversations. And I'm a high school person, but but I remember that. So think about this for all grades. Next slide. So one of the things that contributes to creating a space for belonging for all staff and families and, and, and caregivers is an acknowledgement that diversity does matter. Um, and there are multiple ways in which my role, you know, it's in my title. Um, I will share some rationale later, which I think will be helpful. But the most important thing here is 
As a district, we've committed to equitable hiring processes. And one basic framework is that I and I will meet with all faculty, not just the hiring committees, but all faculty at each of the schools and share very uh, a very specific and targeted conversation about anti-bias -hire, anti hiring practices. This importance of all is all, meaning that as each year we'll do the same, we'll have a similar conversation with each hiring um, manager so that it's clear about what are the, what are the um, pitfalls that we need to be mindful of. So if we go to the next slide, this is what we talk about. There's an acknowledgement that systemic racism forms a barrier to hiring and retaining educators of color at every phase of the process from college enrollment to the selection bias or MTEL prep, MTEL passage. But as a school district, we need to counteract the impacts of racism by applying aggressive and inter in innovative interventions at every stage. Next, next slide. So I thought I, I said I, earlier I would share a little research. These two bullets are very common. There's a lot of there's a lot of research, and there's a growing body that highlights the value of teacher diversity, and most in particular for all students, not just students of color. And there is specific data on the correlation between a black child who has just one black teacher in elementary school and what their outcomes are for enrollment for um, college enrollment. What I would actually ask you to consider as well, there is also research that, that also acknowledges that any child that has two strong teachers back to back also has a higher outcome in their academic achievement. So it's strength in numbers and strength in consistency. So it's applicable both for this particular research that specifically identifies race and gen uh, race and in all education in terms of students having back-to-back -back strong educators. So this is my longest slide here, even though it has only five bullets, but I do wanna go through, I'm sorry, next slide. I do wanna go through this because this is a piece for me that when I read this research, um, reinforced the value that I place and in the work of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, but in the value, the responsibility I make as a, a K-12 educator in preparing students. So the benefits of diversity in education, especially higher ed education, stretch far and wide, affecting students' academic and social experiences. So number one, through culturally diverse classrooms and social interactions, students have the opportunity to learn from people with different backgrounds and upbringings, leading to increased innovation and collaboration. Number two, through a diverse campus, students are presented with daily opportunities to interact with people of various backgrounds, which enables them to learn to communicate more effectively and often differently than they previously were accustomed to. Students who are often raised, number three, students are often raised around people of similar socioeconomic and racial and cultural characteristics. For many students, regardless of whether or not they identify as part of a minority or culturally diverse population, the college will challenge predisposed stereotypes that may have developed during adolescence. When presented with opportunities to critically explore these experiences, Students become more accepting, tolerant, and thoughtful members of society. Four, having culturally diverse peers isn't the only way students benefit from diversity on campus. For many students, it's a chance to see someone from a similar background that they, emu they can emulate. And this is especially impactful for students from historically underrepresented communities. And five, According to the American Council on Education, education within a diverse setting prepares students to become good citizens in an increasingly complex, pluralistic society. It fosters mutual respect and teamwork. 
It helps build communities whose members are judged by the quality of their character and their contributions. It would be a disservice for us if our students, for the first time, encounter experiences at the higher ed level um, that they didn't get to practice, learn about, explore as K-12 students. So staff, diverse staff are important. The diversity of teachers are important. The diversity and the complexity and the, and the joy of students are important. All of these are variables that actually are very impactful for students beyond K-12. It impacts them at the higher ed level and actually beyond. So I just wanted to sit with this for a bit. Thank you. So next slide, yep. This is a simple one. Um, my role, the reason I kept this as a slide, as a goal, is that it's important for me to work collaboratively with the new assistant superintendent. It's important for you to know that our work is connected and it is focused on um, supporting um, students' voices throughout the curriculum. So I place this here as a your as my responsibility, um, and you can hold me accountable to this particular one. So if you go to the next slide, and this is the reason why. These are products that were um, created before, um, in the fall, I believe. But this was contrib this this slide deck and the next slide. These were used as part of artifacts to share for in the Youth in Unity event in January. But these are our kids. This, these are our families. These are the books. This is the way in which the work that we've talked about comes to life for our students, for all of our students. Next slide. I'm feeling like I'm, I want to make sure I, I feel like I'm running late. So I, what I will do is this, um, two more. Um, this is my favorite goal in all of my goals. The idea that I get to, to really be responsible for creating and nurturing joy and passion um, and and the goal is to that I have to plan, execute, and attend events um, that make me in that I'm required to interact with staff, family, students, community members, and the entire purpose is to build and sustain strong and substantive relationships. Um, what that will look like is some of the lists that I have here and others. So when you see me in spaces like right today is fulfilling this goal because I want to create opportunities for to build long-term relationships. And I have next slide. This is this is the mission statement for ABC for ABC. Um and you've heard all about the work I've been doing and the work we do in, Water, in Watertown Public Schools. And you see how well this mission statement connects to the work that we want to have in our schools and why my role working to support this organization and be part of the relaunching is connected to the work that we're doing in Watertown Public Schools. When I saw this mission statement, I just thought it's just such a, mission statements are hard to get quite right. This is a very strong mission statement and I loved it. I loved that. I loved also that I didn't have to make one. It's the hardest thing to do. Next slide. I talked about our commitment to the Watertown um, Unity Breakfast. If you go to the next slide. These are some of our students. These are your children. They're so silly. I love the right one. Next slide. Next 
Next slide. So we had high school students. We had elementary students engaged. Um, it means something. It's a nice place in the year for reflection. And you saw artifacts of store um, book covers from the first grade, um, students coming together and singing in community. Um, there's a lot of places where the community comes together and it just, it makes sense when we're planful how all our different entities can be in, in relationship. And you, in this, I like this slide because there's a whole series of conversations happening. <laughs> But there's a lot of community being built in this space here. And the whole purpose was to come together for the Youth and Unity event in support of the Unity Breakfast. And this is all real, this is not made up. I wanna just, if we go one more and then I think I'm good. Um, my last is, is focusing on equity-based decision-making tool for finance. So in order for sustainability, this work has to be across multiple spheres within an organization. So I said I was working with the assistant superintendent for teaching and learning so that I make a commitment to stay connected to the curricular piece of um, this work. And I said in collaboration, I, I don't know what our role it will be. My role will be, but we'll be working together. Um, hiring and and hiring and bringing new staff, that's working in collaboration with our director of HR. But again, it's about being part of that aspect of an organization. And funding and finance, it's a huge part of an organization. We started doing equitable um, an equitable um, finance process this year. It will be a formal process. It's called equity-based decision-making, and we'll have a tool that we'll be using to implement for the next fiscal year. So I've talked about things that are um, across the organization. Um, and I wanted to just end with, if you go to the next slide, when, when you think about this work, what does it look like and feel like? Um, and it looks like this. And 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 Jennifer, you can just um, go to the next slide and and just keep scrolling. Um, take yeah. This is a um, the Low Culture Fest. People wouldn't leave. We had to kick them out at 7.30, 7.45, because we had to go home. There was way too much food. This event had people like a mariachi band. Um, kids had passports they had to go to each table to sign off on. That's a that's that side. If you pause right there, this is in the gymnasium. We were in here. Think no, we were in. I was in the other room, which is at two rooms. This, the other side was the cafeteria, and when we were closing, that side was empty. I was like at seven thirty. I'm like, oh good, we're all done. I walked in, and this is what the other side looked like at seven thirty. So yeah, you can continue. This event was like a family barbecue. The adults were off talking with each other somewhere and the kids were just running around, doing whatever they need to do and coming back and running around and doing things. Um, and at the end, I want you asked about, you know, community. These individuals at the end donated um, food, for the event and the kids signed little uh, thank yous. Hold on this. And the, the, these members of our community um, gave little things and big things, but just they were so excited to be part of our celebration. 
Um, I think that's it. If you go one more, I think I just have like a little, yeah, what to do. Um, that's it. I, I, I'll definitely share the slides with everyone so you can have that. But I hope this gives you all um, just a bigger, a better sense. Um, well, I hope it answered the question about the work that we're doing and what we're planning to do next year. Um, and I wanted to be available to ask questions, answer any questions. And I hope it wasn't too cumbersome in a presentation. And Sheila had no idea. I'm glad I'm embarrassing her. <laughs> I think it was fabulous myself. I'm just gonna jump in and say that. So um, if you wanna raise your hand physically or you, if you have wanna raise your hand from the reactions, um, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Sarah, and thank you so much. That was just fabulous, really inspiring. And I'm glad Sheila got a nice shout out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing is this, honestly, um, I came to stuff that already existed. I didn't create anything, right? Um, and that's what you have to hear, that these are, my my skill is alignment, um, like making things better. I, I don't, this was, that culture fest had, I've never seen anything like that. And it was just families. Wouldn't you say, Sheila, wasn't it like that? So I can answer any questions if people... Hi, Merle, how are you? Giovanni <laughs> has her hand up. I just want to say how proud I am of you, Dr. Daly. I was actually one of the students that pe uh, petitioned for the DEI position, and... Um, you know, it's been a lot of work ever since I was in seventh grade. I've been working with Watertown Public Schools. I, uh, throughout my uh, career as a student at Watertown Public Schools, it was seven or eight years I've worked towards a lot of the things that are happening today. A lot of the stuff that you mentioned on the slides, I was so happy to see because, you know, me and uh, a lot of other students work really hard to plant the seeds. And we're really happy to have you as a part of our Wartown community. I've definitely heard a lot about you and I've been meaning to sit down with you, but I didn't get the chance, but I'll definitely make that a point, especially after tonight, <laughs> seeing all the work that you've done. So thank you so much for doing everything. You don't know how, it me how much it means to so many people, including me. So I could not be more grateful. It Nothing is better than you know, uh, finding out that your efforts that you made a few years ago are now making a difference. And there's someone that is willing to support that kind of work and make it happen. And, you know, we're, it's great to have people like you uh, in administration that are willing to, you know, push the student voices and all, all this work and bring new ideas and do all this work. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, that's going to be what year, what grade are you now? I'm actually on my second uh, gap year. I'm 20, but oh. I graduated Watertown High in 2022. Okay. Well, you know, there might be some cool internships at the Watertown Public Schools for folks who are doing stuff. Just an idea. All right. <laughs> Thank you for I'm passing not that kidding. Along. All right. I'll also Thank mention you. that Shivani is. Um, someone we have known and helped support since she was in middle school and wow. was in the first Kingian training, Kingian club after school program and eventually um, all the way up to high school and petitioning the school for Kingian training in the schools. And uh, she's pretty amazing. And she is the newest member of the Watertown Citizens for Peace, Justice and Environment steering. Oh, excellent. Any other questions, comments, hands up, reactions from anyone? I'm just going to say, I'm going to jump in again and just say that I can't believe you've only been here for six months. <laughs> it's, 
so wonderful all that you've done so far and the grasp that you have on everything that does need to be done. So I just feel very fortunate to have you here in Watertown and I'm so glad you were able to be here tonight um, to share this with other people in our community. Oh, you're welcome. I've enjoyed this. Deborah? Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you had put at one point what we can do uh, to help your efforts. Uh, you no, know, our community. One, uh, of, the so, things, one yeah. of the things, um, and I shared with you all before, I think there's a lot going on in Watertown. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say that share any events, any programs, any activities, because one of the things I want to do is make sure that we show up at each other's things because there's so many things to do. So I don't want us to, as a district, start to um, replicate things that have already existing and as opposed to really making sure we amplify and connect um, people together. Um, I have... Feet. Are there any folks that you think we should be talking to? Um, I have this, I don't want to say it out loud. Well, I, I do think I can envision a time um, where there's community conversations. I hate the term because it makes so much other meaning. But there are things that we might want to learn together. And um, there may be people who are really good at sharing what they know and do. I'll give an example. Um, we had a joint DBC meeting in February at the Cunning. And I invited a colleague of mine who was at, who is at Boston Public Schools. Um, she's a musician. Um, she's an assistant um, head uh, principal at a school. Um, but what she was, she has a collection of black dolls. Um, and our, our DBC and the equity facilitators were trying to think about what's the most authentic way to honor, I said honor, honor, um, Black History Month that didn't seem performative, but really was about learning collectively. So she has this passion for Black dolls and she collected Black dolls. A, because they were able, she was able to pull, um, um, collect significant historical figures. And she herself, I didn't know this, she grew up in segregated um, South and came to Boston. Um, she was recruited from Cambridge, College, Cambridge Public Schools to from her town in, I don't know the Southern um, state, to teach in Cambridge and she's never left. She's taught in you know Cambridge and Boston. But that whole day, that evening was about 25 people listening to a person who was very passionate about something that they enjoy, that in and of itself was historic because it had a historical context. It was a showing something that someone loves and also engaging a community that was asking questions back and forth it was an intimate but public conversation. And I think for everyone who went, it felt like um, that interesting person that you meet at some party and you're just learning from them and you're, oh, come over here and see, this is, but my reason for sharing it in that way is that it felt like it was very much honoring the celebration of the month. It was at a conversation with families about someone's passion. And one of the things, one of the parents said is like, oh, it's so weird that you have a hobby. I'd like to have a hobby as a parent. But you know what it made me think is, could DBCs be book clubs? Could be other places where families, like for those moms and dads, if they can have a, a, a night off to do something like this. So how you can help, I think, is to, Come to the um, Anti-Bias Coalition is a great network that's convening. Um, bring ideas and activities and also ways in which we can work together on doing things for our communities and our students. Um, I go to the um, race reels because as I shared with a colleague who is there, 
it's it's not a huge room. There's not a ton of people there. But the point is, it's for folks who find that's a place they want to be. And it's the right size for them to be in, in community and relationship, that the value and the richness of the conversation doesn't change because you had 20 people versus 10 people. Um, if we can continue to create spaces like that across Watertown, where people can find what they need to learn about the community, and if the underlying factor is um, a, 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 an event or programming that allows folks to build sustainable relationships, um, learn more deeply about what it means to be anti-bias, anti-racist, I think that there are lots of ways we can be in collaboration. Any other goals that seem crazy? <laughs> I want, I know Ingrid, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I don't, I actually think that they all hang together pretty good, actually. And the only concern is I want to be sure you get the stuff that you need. Well, well I am, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, when I first came in, um, the superintendent said, you have this budget, what do you need? And I'm probably because I'm parents of, um, because I'm from the Caribbean, I can't just waste money. Um, I, I took some time and um, we are gonna have a, a staff member next year. Um, the role is, is, if you think about the work, the role is going to be very much classroom facing teacher support around um, actualizing the type of racial equity in classrooms through curriculum that's gonna be needed. And what I mean by that is sometimes you need someone to show you how to do something and you need to be available. So it's like a coach, but I don't wanna use the term coach because I, I know that has other meanings within the district. The reason I'm pausing is that I wanna do it in collaboration, as I said, we have a new assistant super of TNL coming. It doesn't make sense to create a position that doesn't connect with and integrate with the entire district's effort around curriculum. So I'm very, very. I you should be you should be listening for sustainability. You should be listening for something that will repeat and grow and repeat and because it only works if it will be here next year. So I am getting the support. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm feeling very confident and comfortable with the support. I'm actually hiring for an um an admin now, an admin assistant, and we're probably gonna start selecting those individuals soon. Um, and next year I, I have some plans. I know what I know what we need, and I need to confirm it year to year. So what I do need is I know my faculty, the faculty, and school leaders need someone more regularly available to their staff in buildings to give them support in um, modeling or any kind of um, academic practice uh, processes, so. That's good. Heather, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I was, mine was just a comment that I am, um, I went to the February DBC meeting oh. um, where um, the dolls were shared and that was just, it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting and it was so, um, it was just, it was like not anything I'd ever been to. Like, it was just so unique and so wonderful and to just sort of enjoy something that somebody else loves and to sort of sit in this like sharing of something she loves mm -hmm. and us all talking about it. It was just, it was like wonderful. And I actually, I texted like Sheila and a couple other people and we're like, can we do this with parents? Can we have like a parent hobby night where someone like brings the spoons they carve or someone brings their, because well, it was just- remember, I, That's what exactly I thought. You know what? Okay, knitting club. Uh, like, Something. yes, that's it. I'm so glad you said that because it really did feel like, like, yeah, wait a second. Why can't you have a hobby? And you almost felt like we gotta, we gotta, we gotta do that. We could yeah. do that. That would be so much fun. It would be. And it was yeah, just, it was a nice night. reminder of um, building community for the sake of building community. Like that's what it felt like is we were there to build community and to be there with each other and experience each other. And so it was really lovely. 
No, oh, I'm, I'm so glad you, I didn't, I didn't know she was going to be here. And I would see, this is the thing about being the same everywhere, because I would have said it if you were here or not, but that's exactly what that feeling was. It was, it was really, it was, you're right. It was really lovely. That's what it was. And that word, like people just were like, wow, this is great because she was, she was really into it, but in like an authentic way. Right. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, thanks Heather for saying something. Any other comments or questions for Saren? Okay, it feels like we're sort of winding down or have wound down. And um, I just one thing before we sign off, if we were to sign off shortly, that um, I realized, you know, I did mention in my report for the refugee support group about the the crisis or whatever the impending crises that we're facing with the potential shutting down of a of the place where all these migrants are living, um, I would like for that not to be shared beyond this meeting, because we are not wanting to distress families or anyone else. Or um, I know Katie, who left, had privately uh, texted me that she, because she teaches at the Hosmer and she's teaching a number of these children that uh, we want to make sure that no one gets traumatized in any way without us being able to prepare for whatever happens. We don't know what will happen. And so I just want to mention that if we can please keep that um, quiet for right now. So so to that point, I know this is recorded. Um, I don't know how you distribute it, but I will make sure you guys get a copy of my slide deck um, so that the I don't know who the community is for the organization, but I just want to let you guys know that. Thanks, that would be great, really great. So thank you again, Sarah, and thank you all for coming and sharing your thoughts and, and good ideas as well. But it's very inspiring uh, to know. So what I, what I will do is when I send, um, I'm gonna send like, a, there's a, at the very end is a, a sign up for the ABC so you can at least get the mailing information so you'll get that info. Um, and also if you have any feedback for me, and if you have any um, anything you want to add to the community calendar. Um, but don't worry, I'll send it as an email. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you to everyone for coming. And thank you especially to Dr. Saren Daly. You are wonderful. We're lucky thank to have you. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. And I just got a reminder from Tony asking us to make sure we stopped recording. Can you do that, Pam? No, I'm not a host. Oh, should I uh, do that? Yeah, I mean, some, whoever has been... Does, I, I'm a co-host. How do I stop recording? Um, you should have a control at the bottom. All right, hang on one second. I got a call come in. Hi Nicole, can you hold on one second? Hey, call me when it's call me when you're ready. I'm I'm uh, I'm just working at my desk. Okay, I have to stop the recording. <laughs> yeah, take your time. Okay, take your time. I'll call you. Bye. I think if you tap where it says recording on the screen, or we're recording. Well, it That's... still says record on the upper on the upper left from what I see, but I don't I don't have any control over it. Or you can just make me a co-host and I'll figure it out. All right. Sorry, this is not one of my strengths. So normally if we if we leave the meeting, it should stop recording. Um purchase defense. Oh, it says record on this computer, record to the cloud. Right. Tony has has left, but he's still logged in. So we need to make sure the meeting is ended for everyone. All right. Wait a minute. Let me let me go. Oh no. All right. <laughs> Um, let me see if I can find you and make you a co-host and oh, I, I, if I go to stop video, is that it? That should do it. No, that stopped your video. <laughs> um, <laughs> never mind. Um, 
I can't figure out how to make you a co-host. Oh, um, you go to participants? Yeah, that's where I am, and I'm under more, but um, I can put in re waiting room, remove, or report. No, <laughs> I don't think you want to do that. <laughs> you should see the recording indicator at the top of your screen. Let's see. Oh, I'm trying to... Uh, So, ay, ay, ay. if you end the meeting and make sure that you meet in it for everyone. I'm just clicking on different things, trying to figure out what I'm doing here. Um, and I'm trying to get rid of Tony. Oh, pause recording. Oh, wait, stop recording. Yes. Stop recording. So that was the cloud recording. It, but it's still, I still see the recording button on. Me too. So somehow I had gotten <laughs> recording to the cloud, but, um, Ay, ay, ay. I don't know, Pam. Um, <laughs> all right. Mute, stop video. Share screen. Okay. I'm going to, well, I don't think it's going to help you to share the screen. Apps. Who can start a collaboration? Uh, Participants invite record on this computer. No. It just says the recorded file will be report recorded to something when the chat session ends. So I think if we just end, it'll stop. Yeah. Just end make sure you do end the meeting for all. For, for all instead of just leaving. Wait, I still see Tony.